You know, it's, it's interesting. We uh, continue to learn things. The two hymns I, I chose actually, again, turned out to be copyrighted, so I think I'm three for six. Um, but we'd also mentioned at the beginning that we had determined that instead of uh, really three classes, we had four. And so we were trying to squeeze four classes into three. We were unsuccessful doing that last week. And as our presider already said, we have one more day that we have today to try to do that. So um, we will attempt to try to cover the material, hit the highlights. And uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's all hopefully for our mutual benefit. And I do thank you for the patience and the support that I've received over the last few weeks, uh, the various words of encouragement. And I do pray that everything that we've done and considered is, is obviously helpful in some way in supporting your wilderness wanderings and obviously to lead us to the promised land, which really is the kingdom of God. Um, I actually was also, uh, in this last week, given a real Pomodoro. So I was, I was very thrilled to uh, see that on my doorstep. And I wasn't sure whether I needed to set the timer for today to ensure that we finished on time. Um, but I'm thinking I might just sort of keep it aside and, and use it the next time I'm about to do my study. And I can set the timer and, and uh, hopefully initiate some focus in order to get the, what needs to be done, done. So just as a very quick high level summary of sort of what we've gone over in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we started off by really saying we, we should try to identify and try to fix, as it were, or try to overcome one bad habit that we have and to make that cue, that, that initiation of that craving, invisible. And then we wanted to focus on the positive, try to identify a, a new good habit, something that we'd like to form, something that we'd like to uh, encourage ourselves in our walk, and to find a cue, to find that, that trigger that would then um, make it visible and hopefully encourage us to repeat the behavior. And then we looked at trigger verses, memory to identify, again, most likely the first habit that we were trying to overcome, the bad habit, but to find a trigger verse, something that would, would resonate in our minds to redirect our focus and to hopefully, again, turn us away from that cue that would lead to craving and the response that would lead to sin. We also talked about doing a word audit, kind of walking through our homes and looking at the various plaques and signs and, and, and you know, triggers or memories that we would like to put forward as far as the word of God and, and see if there was rooms that maybe it was lacking. Or perhaps find something that we hadn't realized to be hanging on the wall for so long we'd forgotten about it and to take an opportunity to move it, reposition it, and to keep it fresh in our homes and in our minds. We talked about stacking habits building on something that's already an established pattern, obviously a good pattern, and to layer on something that's new um, that again would help move us forward in our walk. We talked about how important it is to have a strong guide to our conscience and how critical it was to, to raise up children, not only as, as a heritage to our father, but to give them that foundation of conscience which would be a guide to their lives going forward. And obviously the encouragement that we have to do every day to, to continue to strengthen our guide. We talked about using the Ten Commandments as a checklist for when we're doing our screen time, whether it's watching TV or looking through a social media feed. And then finally, the Pomodoro technique was really using a timer to initiate a focus around study so, and to break it up into manageable chunks and to, again, try to use a technique that can sometimes help um, some of us that are procrastinators and get easily distracted by other things. So our first section that we want to look at then this morning is around trusting in the Lord and what does that look like. And what I'd like to do is have us turn to Deuteronomy chapter 29 and we're going to look at verses 4 and 5. Actually, we're going to look at the sort of the first section of verses because Moses, Moses says a very interesting thing in Deuteronomy 29. And he starts off by really pointing out in verse 4, Yet the Lord hath not given you a heart to perceive, sorry, a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear unto this day. So he kind of points out that Yahweh had not given the children of, of Israel a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear. And then it immediately follows with, pointing out two amazing miracles that had occurred in the journeyings, in the wanderings of the people of Israel. And that comes in in verse five. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness 
Your clothes are not waxen old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxen old upon your feet. And as we just read in Deuteronomy 8, he also added that their feet did not blister. They didn't even wear down physically in this 40-year walk through the wilderness. Well, this word perceive in verse 4 is, is interesting and compelling to think about. Uh, it's more commonly translated to know, but there is this underlying idea of to know by seeing, to ascertain by seeing. And uh, of the other definition of the word is for it to be revealed, so to, in a sense to be uncovered. And so for the very first time, if we look at the first time it's used, it's actually in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5. And it's actually the serpent speaking to, to Eve. And he says in Genesis 3 verse 5, and I'll just read that for us. Uh, and we're probably very familiar with this verse. He says, for God doth know, and that's the word translated perceive in Deuteronomy 29. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, and it's interesting what will happen, your eyes shall be opened. And you shall be as God, and then the other word is knowing, which also is the same Hebrew word perceive, knowing good and evil. And so there's this idea of discernment. It's a deeper appreciation of the, of the situation. It's ascertaining by seeing. And yet in Deuteronomy 29, there, well actually let's go back, we're still there. In Deuteronomy 29, Moses is, is kind of bringing these ideas for, forward. He says in verse two, that ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto Pharaoh. You've seen these things. And then in verse three, when he speaks of the great temptations or trials, it says, your eyes have seen, seen the signs and those great miracles. And Moses brings these things forward to them. You've seen all these things, and yet in verse four, you do not have a seeing heart. You don't have a heart that perceives. And in some cases, it's, it's hard to imagine how the people of Israel could not realize that for 40 years, their shoes didn't wear out and their garments didn't wear out. I mean, really, think of us. Do any of us have a pair of shoes that we've had for 40 years that we've worn every day and it's never worn out? You'd think it would be something that we would notice. One of the other things that I do is, uh, or that we were possibly gonna do is, is read from Psalm 78. So I do wanna turn there, it's, it wasn't our reading, but there's a couple of things I would like to point out. Because it, again, it's chronicling the wilderness wanderings in, through the psalmist. And what he's doing here is he's really bringing forward and recounting the provisions of God in the wilderness. And so if we were to look at verse 20, for instance, it says, behold, Moses smote the rock and the waters gushed out. The streams overflowed. I mean, it's very dramatic language. So we have this provision of water, which is critical to life. And then in verse 24, it says that he gave them the corn of heaven. In fact, he even makes mention of that man in, in verse 25 did eat angels' food. And then in verse 27, if we cast our eyes down, it says that rain, it, he rained flesh down upon them. He rained flesh upon them as the dust. And the disappointing thing that the psalmist points out after all this is he's chronicling these, these events and these provisions by God. In verse 32, he says, for all this, they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. They sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Their, their hearts did not see the provisions of God. They did not see that their clothing and their shoes were not wearing out. They did not see that their feet were not being blistered. They did not perceive. We could say maybe in, these, in today's language, they weren't grateful. They obviously lacked, a, there was a general lack of appreciation for all the provisions and miracles of God. And he used intentionally this word grateful because gratefulness seems to be very much in vogue today. You hear a lot of people commentating and, and expressing how, how grateful they are as, a, as an outcome of the pandemic. It's kept us indoors and we've, we've missed family, we've missed associations, we've missed going out for dinner. All of these things that we so now sort of have time to reflect and we're more grateful for. And yet, what is it about the pandemic that makes us more grateful now? Why weren't we grateful two years ago? And what is it that we can do to be more grateful? 
which I think is really our, our consideration. Well, there's a lecturer, kind of put his image there. His name is David Standelras, and he speaks on gratefulness. He's been sort of making the circuits recently, and interesting, what he says echoes right back to how God was directing his people, and ultimately how God directs us in our wilderness wanderings. And I really, the reason I bring this forward is it's interesting a little bit about his background. He's written a book, he speaks a message of gratefulness that seems to resonate and, and they say is very timely for today. And on the one hand, I cannot help but see that what he's promoting as a method to develop gratefulness has to have some reference in the scriptures. And the reason why I say that is because he happens to be a Benedictine, a Catholic Benedictine monk. He's familiar with the scriptures. So there, there, there has to be some reference and some connection. And again, it just re reconfirms what I said at the very beginning of our classes, there is nothing new under the sun. Everything we bring forward is a new technique or a new idea. God has already established in patterns in his word. And we just sometimes need to bring these forward, which really is what David Standel Rass has done. He's just bring it forward in today's simpler language. What is disappointing is that even though he has this, let's say, persuasion of mentioning God, he doesn't mention God. He doesn't bring him into the conversation at all. In fact, he comes across as being very non-denominational as well. And yet, really, what I wanted to point out is that there's principles of God being expressed and established in this simpler language. And we can make some con connections or comparisons to what is recorded in Exodus. So the first step that he points out is we need to stop. And I think ultimately this is what the pandemic has done. It's forced on us to stop. It's something we should have been doing sooner. We're, we're so busy in our lives. It doesn't matter if we're in the workforce trying to do more with less, whether it's every day, every week, every month, every year, or whether we're staying at home, we're trying to raise our families, we're preparing meals, we got, out, we got school activities both before and both afterwards. We also layer on top of that the fact that we want to be entertained and we want to go out. We want to engage in different activities, garden in the backyard, you know, uh, start our new hobby or continue our old one. There is an unlimited number of activities and intrusions into our lives, and many of them are self-inflicted. And so we just need to stop. And how many times has God said the same thing? In Exodus chapter 14 and verse 13. When the children of Israel were flanked by the Red Sea on one side and the chariots of Egypt on the other side, God starts off by saying, fear not, stand still. The Israelites were affected by fear. And we saw that previously. Their default behavior when they were in circumstances of trial and being proven by God always seemed to default back to carnal thinking back to Egypt and wanting to go back to their former lives and they were anxious clearly they were anxious they've got they've got seemingly no escape on one side and they've got the Egyptian chariots on the other side and in these cries of oh it would have been so much better to stay in Egypt you can imagine what other fretful and anxious conversations were happening amongst the people and so God just says stop, stand still just stop and we'll see that there's more to this verse as we go forward, but we, we do need to stop being distracted and stop being anxious and just stand still. And of course, we know it's, it's not enough simply to stop, but we have to look. We have to be aware and we have to use all of our senses. Deuteronomy 29 mentions the seeing and the hearing. Look at all the signs and the miracles and look what was done before your eyes. The psalmist, as we, says, as we know in Psalm 34, says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so we have all of these senses, touch and smell and seeing and hearing. And that's fundamentally the problem with the people of Israel. They didn't have a heart to perceive. They didn't have a, the ability to discern by seeing and by hearing and by tasting and by touching and by smelling. It's very much what Elihu is trying to to provoke Job to consider. He said in Job 37, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. 
And so here again, on the shores of the Red Sea, Yahweh says, stop and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will show you this day. See with a perceiving heart. Look what I'm about to do for you. We know that the angel encamps around those that fear him and deliver us them. That's in Psalm 34. The Israels would see, but not with a perceiving heart, not with a seeing heart. They would see the Egyptians literally buried in the sea before their very eyes. And yet beyond that, they could not see in their wilderness wandering that their clothes didn't wear out and their shoes didn't wear out. So what do we not see in the provisions of God in our daily lives? What are we blind to in effect? We can't say that we've had a pair of shoes that haven't worn out for 40 years. And yet in this part of the world, I would suggest that many of us have more than one pair of shoes in our closet. And I would suggest that none of us have ever had a pair of shoes completely wear out before we've replaced them or we've swapped out and worn another pair. In effect, it's the same thing. We've never had shoes wear out over the last 40 years for those of you that have been alive that long. But there is one more step to this process. From the secular perspective, or what David Stendhal Rest was promoting, he says the step is go. And it's interesting that, that even the world today, and we're talking about something that was fairly recent, they recognize that if we stop all the distractions in our lives, look and consider at the moment that the provisions and the things that are around us, the opportunities to appreciate what is provided, that there's a recognition that there should be a conscious determination to do something about it to go. The analogy, and this is again, it's a real simple mental image that we can put in our minds, but the analogy is crossing the street. We stop at the curb, we look both ways, and then we go. We go to whatever the destination is that we're about to. And even walking across the street is a decision of life and death, especially if there's lots of traffic. But this is where the world gets it wrong. The world wants to be grateful for all the stuff that they're missing. They want to be grateful for what they can do for themselves, the lust that they can pursue and satisfy, to rely on their own arm. They're grateful for the vaccine that was invented you know, and, and that's been put out. But God had a different message to the people of Israel in Exodus 14. Here it says that the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. The Lord shall fight for you. In, in reality, he just says, trust me. In spite of everything you see all around you, just trust me, stand still, and see what I'm about to do for you. Yahweh will fight for you. It was also interesting that the lecturer also made another comment. He says, when we're grateful, we're not fearful. And that's true. That's what it says here, fear not and stand still. But I think in this context, it's a little bit different than what the lecture had intended, but it is the same thing, that if we are truly grateful, we will not fear, and we will be able to see what God has provided for us and see that the angels do encamp around us. So I was mentioning how you know, we could look at Psalm 78 as one of our readings, and if we go back to that and we look at verse 22, of Psalm 78, it says this, it says, because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. And that's sort of really what the part of the problem is that they didn't believe in God and so they trusted not in his salvation. If we go back to Deuteronomy 29, if we're actually still there, I'm just gonna flip back real quick. Deuteronomy 29, it's interesting how, how at this point in time, Yahweh seems to be opening up the eyes of the people to the things that they had been blind to and that they'd been missing. In verse 4, which we've already read, it says that the heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear unto this day. Unto this day. And so we could read this two ways. We could say, well, they haven't seen and they still don't see even unto the today that this was written. But alternatively, and I'd like to think it this way, it says, you've wandered through the wilderness and you haven't seen these things unto this day. 
that now as Moses stands with them, he's going to, sh to remind them and show them and have them recognize what, they have, what has happened to them and what they can see. And so now it was brought to their attention. It was brought to their attention in those verses where he says, look at your shoes and look at your clothes. And you didn't eat just bread, you ate manna in the wilderness. All of these things should demonstrate why they should trust in Yahweh and not in themselves. We know that well-known passage of the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to us and to the disciples in, in Matthew chapter six. In verse 30, he ends it by saying, oh, ye of little faith, which is literally, oh, ye that trust too little. And then in verse 31, it says, take no thought for what you shall eat or what you shall drink or with, wherewith you shall be clothed. For all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And so as we consider this just simple step of stop, look, and go in obedience to trust in God, we can see that it was done on a much bigger scale also for them. At the very beginning, at the end of six days of creation, God rested. The Sabbath was a commandment in, to the nation of Israel in the Ten Commandments. The Sabbath was recorded as a sign or a cue to prompt them to be grateful and to reflect. In Isaiah 58, if you want to make a, a, a note in Isaiah 58, verse 13, there really is an expression by the prophet about what God would like us to do on the Sabbath or in these times of reflection. To turn our foot away, or if thou turn thy foot away from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on the holy day, and do this instead, call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, and not doing thine own ways, not finding thine own pleasure, not speaking thine own words, then thou shalt delight thyself in Yahweh. So there's this time of reflection that God instituted, a, a, a regular stop among the activities of the people to set this time aside to reflect on God and not on themselves. He also instituted the daily sacrifices. And I draw this parallel to look. Because even through their daily lives, the people of Israel would, would have smelt the this, this sacrifices in the air. Maybe if they were close enough, they'd even smelled a, a whiff of incense or perfume you know, from, from the, uh, from the uh, altar of incense. So there was, there's, I think sometimes we miss the aspect of that there was a smell that was also amongst the camp and that was an opportunity that as they were going through their lives, they could, they could stop and they could look, they could use their senses to appreciate what was being done for them. But unfortunately, there's many that would not have a heart that could perceive. And so, lastly, there is this decision of what to do. If you look at all these things and all the things that God did when the tabernacle and the pillar of fire and the smells and everything around them, for those that would stop, those that would appreciate, those would then be compelled or hopefully that was the next step to obey to follow God and to to trust in everything that he was doing for them God was imploring his people to obey his laws and to do his pleasure not their way not their own and so the summary of all this is that God supplies evidence daily that he is there and that we can believe in him and that we can trust in him but that is that's one of the challenges we have in this day and age is, is trust is differentiated in today's world. We, we trust based on the circumstance. If I said to you that, uh, do you trust elementary school teachers? You would pause and say, well, trust them to do what? No, I might say, well, to teach young people to read. And you say, oh, that's, that's good. I, I can trust them to do that. But if I said, well, um, would you trust them to drive the school bus? you might be a little bit more hesitant to immediately uh, adopt that. The point is, is that trust is actually a response and it's a response to a demonstration of trustworthiness. We, we glanced quickly at Psalm 78. They, the Israelites believed not God 
and trusted not in his salvation. There was that the demonstration of God, but then they didn't actually translate that into a response of trust. There's a, a current thought leader called Honora O'Neill, and she pointed out that if, if somebody is trustworthy, then the reaction is to trust them. If they demonstrate these characteristics, and the correct characteristics, as she pointed forward, it was competency, reliability, and honesty. So even in our daily lives, if somebody proves themselves as being competent, reliable, and honest, we in turn are more inclined to trust them. And so the challenge we have to today is, is society no longer wants to even recognize that God exists. They want to remove him from all of the considerations of life. But in the case of the Israelites, they were just blind to these, these demonstrations of competency. Waters gushed out of the rock and demonstrated that there was the ability to provide water, fresh, clean water for the people at any point and in any situation. There was the reliability that was demonstrated by God. Every morning there was manna to pick up off the ground and there was a double portion available for use on the Sabbath. There was the honesty, which really is the rightness, the righteousness of God through the law and the, through the testimony and through the, the trustworthiness of God's word. So the world and Israel have one thing in common. They didn't and they don't believe in God and they do not trust that he will provide what he has promised. And so the question is, is how can we avoid missing what God has provided us? How do we reinforce our own gratefulness? What can we do to stimulate a heart that perceives? And we shouldn't be quick to overlook that the examples in the word of God is, is, is very basic things that Yahweh pointed out in Deuteronomy 8 and Deuteronomy 29 that it was clothing and food. So the question is, how can we avoid missing what God has provided us? How can we reinforce and stimulate a heart that perceives? Well, just as a, as a suggestion, God may not prevent our shoes from wearing out, but so much every day, if we just stop and look and make that decision to go to God in trust and in obedience to his ways, seeking the kingdom first, as the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 6, well, the one idea is to use a gratefulness journal. And this is a fairly recent endeavor by Sister Janice and I, and we place a journal, it's actually just a blank duotang page, or you know, book we just picked up at a, at a store. Uh, so it doesn't need to be fancy or complicated. And what we did is we just place it in an in a obvious spot, and every day we stop and we consider for a moment what God has provided to us, or what, what things we can be grateful for and we make a note of it. So, like I said, it doesn't have to be calm. One day I was just thankful for having clean water, just being able to turn on a tap and drink water out of the tap. It just seemed to be just something that, you know, we overlook so easily. And another day I was thankful that I was taught the truth as a young man, as a child. Now we've been doing it for enough. Janice and I have enough entries that we can go back and actually sort of flip through the previous pages and, and be encouraged and reminded of the things that we've reflected on. The point is we don't want to be blind to the provisions of God every day. And although we may have moments of pain and sorrow and anxiety, we can always find something, however small or however great, that we can be thankful for. And God demonstrates his trustworthiness every day so that we, in turn, can trust him. And so, for this particular section, we really wanted to kind of consider how we exercise gratefulness, hearts that perceive, to take moments every day to stop and to look, like consider, to use all our senses, and to go in obedience to our Father and to trust in everything he's doing for us. And when we see that God demonstrates competency and reliability and honesty and righteousness, we're able to trust him. And so one technique is to start a gratefulness journal. So that was a speed read of class three. <laughs>
So we're just going to take a few minutes then to kind of go through the next section, which is this idea of being motivated by vision. When Yahweh called Moses from the burning bush, he started in verse 7 by saying, I have seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt. I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And then, Mo and then Yahweh, when he was speaking to Moses, lays out the plan. He says, well, I've heard, I've heard what the problem is, and here's what the solution is going to be. I'm going to come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of that land unto a land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Well, the phrase milk and honey is unique to the wilderness wanderings. It's mentioned 20 times in total, and it starts here first in Exodus 3, verse 8. Of, there are a few other occurrences outside of the Pentateuch. There's occurrences in Joshua, in Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and yet every one of them is really just hearkening back to this same time when God took people out of Egypt to bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey. And it just wanted to take a few minutes to really think about what does it mean by a land, <coughs> excuse me, flowing with milk and honey. And it was interesting to actually read the various perspectives of commentators as they, as they looked at this phrase. Now, the common thing was that it's flowing with milk and honey, this land. It's gushing forth is, is what it also means in the Hebrew. And yet when you looked at the commentaries, a lot of them were rooted very much in the literal. They, they couldn't get past looking at the land as it was then or the land as it is today. And they struggled with this promise of God to bring this people to a land flowing with milk and honey because it's dry, it's arid, it's difficult to raise, to produce food and clothing and shelter. And so when you see their conclusions, it's kind of interesting because in the one case, they said, well, Back in that day of Moses, it was most likely goats, maybe some sheep, not likely ca cattle. So again, they immediately start looking at sort of the livestock portion of it. And the idea was that the milk, and the same for the bee honey, didn't require a lot of extra work because whether it's a goat or sheep or cow, um, you know, they just eat the grass and they produce the milk or they're doing all the work. You just have to go and harvest it. And the same thing with bees. They flit around, they get all the pollen and they produce the honey. And so it's not a lot of work on their part. They just have to go and grab the honey. So the idea being is that this, this milk and honey was more about rest from labor. It didn't require a lot of extra work in order to live in this land. It was all being done for you as a, in a sense. There was another perspective which was almost looking at it from the opposite. It looked at milk from goats as, as a yo low yield product. It took a, you know, you didn't get a lot of milk from a goat. And pasture, again, thinking literally, was meager. It was not in, in abundance. And so it was hard to get. So a land flowing with milk and honey would suggest that you had lots of goats and you had lots of pasture because you didn't get a lot of yield. So there would still be a lot of work, but there'd be a great bountiful provision. And then when they looked at honey, it's interesting that they looked at it from the, con uh, from the context of a fruit tree, in part because the Talmud says, interpreted this word honey as honey flows from figs. So it was a focus more on honey or fruit nectar coming from figs and from palm trees. And so if these palm trees or, fr or fig trees were flowing their ju juice, again, it was an indication of, of a rich harvest, that there would be a lot of these trees still would require work, but there would be lots of work to do. The other final consideration was looking at the, um, the understanding of honey as being from bees. And again, looking back in that time, they said, well, there wasn't domesticated bees. There wouldn't be hives. There wouldn't be a place where you could go and, and get honey. You had to go look for it. And just quickly, I was going through my mind, well, we had honey in a lion carcass. We had honey in the cleft of a rock. We had honey laying on the wooded ground at the time of Jonathan. So honey wasn't easily found. It wasn't easily located. It wasn't easily gained. We've already mentioned that goat's milk, obviously, was a low yield and difficult to get. 
And yet in this picture of the land of milk and honey, it's lots of pasture, lots of livestock, lots of flowers and food for the bees, and the land would be flowing with milk and honey. And so in this case, it's really the difficulties of life would be alleviated. So some consistency of themes, but it's interesting to see how everybody was kind of mentally going through this process. But the reality is God was giving them so much more to think about. If we go through this list, we see that, you know, there was a good land. It was a larger, roomy land. In Deuteronomy 8, which we read together, it's, he layers on top of milk and honey. He says there's, there's fountains, there's brooks, there, the valleys are flowing with water. There was fields of wheat and of barley. There was orchards of vines and fig trees and pomegranates and olive oil and honey. There was bread without scarceness. There was stones of iron and hills of brass. So in other words, natural resources and all the metals that you could make, they're all sitting there for you. The question is, is could the Israelites visualize these things? Could they only see the literal? Could they only see milk and honey? Or could they see milk and honey and depths of water springing out of valleys and hills? Could they see fields of wheat and barley? Could they see those orchards and vines and fig trees and pomegranates? Could they see this abundance of bread and of the natural resources of producing iron and brass? I would suggest that there were some, if not most, that couldn't visualize the promised land. Just turn with me to Numbers chapter 13. As we know, Moses sent out 12 spies into the land to spy it out. They came up to the land and they're now going to check it out. He sends out the spies and, and he, he asked them a, a, to look at a, a number of things. Well, determine if the inhabitants were strong or weak. Determine if there was lots of them or few of them. Did they live in tents or did they live in strongholds? Is the land good or is it bad? Is the land fat or is it lean? Is it wooded or not? In other words, is it going to provide everything that we, we want it to provide? And yet, in spite of what was in front of them, 10 could not see past the giants and the strongholds. It was, they, they couldn't visualize what it was that God was going to offer them. And it was only Caleb and Joshua, as we know, when they came forward and, they, the, and the, so the people said, they told them in verse 27, we came into the land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey. We see all these things, but, and this is the fruit thereof. Nevertheless, they couldn't see it, but Joshua and Caleb could. They could see what passed those, those obstacles. But another telling comment about this, this lack of vision, this lack of ability to see things, is actually just a couple of chapters over in number 16. And it's, it's a comment made by Dathan and Abiram particularly, but this is the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And so what we read in, in Deuteronomy chapter 16 and looking at verses 12 to 13, it says, Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, we will not come up. And then look at what they say in verse 13. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of a land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us? Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey or given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. It's, it's hard to get our mind, like, was this really their perspective? That, it, that God was offering them in the land of Canaan nothing different than what they had already left? That the land flowing with milk and honey in the promised land was no better or worse than the land that they had just left in the land of Egypt? Was it true that the land of Egypt was flowing with milk and honey? We know the proverb in Proverb 29, it says where the, there is no vision, the people perish. We see that in the wilderness. Now that idea of word vision 
we know means oracle or dream or revelation. But the, the Israelites had this. They had Moses inspired and speaking to them on behalf of God. He was their mediator to Yahweh. And later through the prophets, they would have visions and revelations and oracles. They would have visions put before them. And we have visions t set for us today. We have our, the entire scripture, the entire word of God, with all of the mind pictures and, and demonstrations and illustrations put before us. But here in the wilderness, the people could not visualize, visualize it. So the question is, how can we prevent ourselves from losing the vision? And we may ask ourselves a question, what difference does it make whether we have a strong vision or not? Does it make a difference whether we think of milk and honey or whether we think of milk and honey? There was an article entitled Mental Rehearsal and Visualization, and it was referenced by Joe Hefner as he recounts a study by the University of Chicago. And they had got brought a group of people together, uh, probably students, and it had to do with shooting free throws. Of course, I have to practice this because I kept on wanting to say three throws, but it's th free throws. Now, for those of you that, that may not know, I'm sure we all do, you stand at the top of the key and you set position and you try to throw the basket through the hoop as a free throw. And so <clears throat> what's interesting is they, they had everybody, first of all, get tested on how accurate, how accurate they were at throwing free throws. And then the groups were divided into three groups. The first group was said, okay, now we're gonna take the next 30 days and you're gonna practice every hour, or every day, sorry, for an hour. And the second group, they said, you're actually not gonna pick up a basketball at all. You're just gonna visualize making free throws for an hour every day for a month. So every day for an hour for a month, you're just gonna visualize taking those shots. And then finally, there was the third group that said, you don't have to do anything. Come back in 30 days and we'll try this all over again. One thing that was really interesting about this study was, was the idea of the visualization was very, very critical, very important how they went through it. Because it wasn't to be done in the third person. They weren't to imagine someone else throwing the free throw. They were to imagine themselves doing it, but in every detail holding the basketball, bouncing the basketball, the sound of the basketball on the, on the floor, the actual motion that you would make with your arm, the arc of the ball, the swish of the net, all of the senses, you would actually visualize yourself taking that free throw and seeing the result of a successful basket and the swish of the net. It was really compelling everybody to immerse themselves and use all of their senses in this aspect of visualization. Well, here is the interesting part. How well did they do? Well, for those that stood at the top of the key and actually took a basketball and threw it in the net, practiced an hour a day for 30 days, improved by 24%. And then there was the group that did absolutely nothing, no surprise, they didn't improve at all. They were no better, they were no worse. The group that visualized improved by 23%, almost as good as those that actually took the basket and actually made the hoop. Now, I'm not suggesting to you kids out there that you just sit down and visualize going to school. But what I do want to reinforce or have this illustrate is that we can use our minds and our imagination. We can use mental rehearsal to improve our ability to do things. And so when we think of this idea of visualization, the people in the wilderness just couldn't see what God was promising them. The land of milk and honey was no better than Egypt. The land of milk and honey was inhabited by giants and fortified cities. The vision of the land of milk and honey was not compelling enough for them to want to obey God, to overcome obstacles, to withstand trial, to trust in Yahweh, to imagine how good the promised land could be. This particular thing is probably for me the most difficult thing to do, and that's to, to, to really visualize the kingdom. A few years ago, our brother Rod Gent walked us through Ezekiel's temple. And one thing he did was try to put the temple in perspective by placing it in our neighborhood. 
when he was trying to get us a sense of scale and scope as a result of the work done by our brother Henry Sully, instead of just saying, well, the one side of the temple is 1.8 kilometers or approximately one hour, one mile, he actually said, well, the temple would start, it would be the length of Southcote starting at Book Road and going down to Garner. So as you drove down that road, you can imagine the temple wall and the side of the temple being on your left-hand side or right-hand side, depending on what direction you're traveling, down that road. So as you drive by, and even now, as, we're, as Book Road members, as you're driving by, can you imagine the temple being physically there? Can you visualize it in your mind, the size and the scope and the scale? It's one benefit of being able to travel to Israel is you can walk through and maybe get a place and a context in which we can imagine these things. Brother Rod also took it one step further and spoke of a sister who loved to sing and could sing well and imagined herself in the court of the singers. She could not only hear their voices, but she could feel her own voice singing along with them when she sang in the, in the hall. The practice of visualization encourages the use of all of our senses. Can we imagine the smell of the cooking? Can we hear the excited voices of the worshipers as we all come together to worship our master? Can we touch the sides of the gate as we enter in through them? Can we see the rise of the columns on the corner of the temple as we pass by? And what about our work in the kingdom? All through scripture, and particularly in, this, in, this, in the wilderness wanderings, there's mention of all of these different positions that are, that are being done, and I, I probably haven't covered all of them, but there was the judges that were appointed by Moses. There's priests, there was captains of fifties, captains of hundreds. There was teachers, there was those appointed to carry the ark. There was the moving and the setting up of the tabernacle. There was shepherds, there was apothecaries to make the incense. There was embroiderers, there was metal workers all of these different kind of, of work to be done and occupations to be done. The psalmist said he'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. It's interesting, even in the Gospels, it mentions occupations. There was tax collectors, there was fishermen, there was tent makers, there was a seller of purple. On another point, you know, can we imagine what would be involved in what Paul said to the Romans, the crea delivering creation from the bondage of corruption after the manifestations of the sons of God? We sort of have this earth that's, that's groaning in earnest expectation for the manifestation of the saints. And, and what does that look like? I can't share the pictures online because of copyright, but there is an artist, um, photographer called Edward Bertinsky. And he chronicled a village of Chinese citizens that were demanded, it was non-optional, to disassemble their city, to literally take it apart, brick by brick, and wheel it out of the way and disassemble their roads, their, their homes, because they were building a dam up, upstream and they were gonna be flooding the entire area. And they now needed those future shipping hazards removed. The houses were now gonna be submerged and would be dangerous to boats. So they were being forced to disassemble their homes and cart them out by wheelbarrow. And he's got some graphic pictures that, that show this happening. What got me thinking was, is that some of the work in the kingdom? Is the dismantling of everything that man has done upon the earth? There was an example that predates Exodus where there was a faithful in scripture being asked to imagine what God has promised and that was Abraham. And Abraham asked God to look up to the heavens, and he said, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven. Well, it doesn't take much to consider that in the wilderness, and certainly back in that time, there was no satellites, there was no city lights to, it was just, when it got dark, you saw the depth of space. And so in the wilderness, when they were in those times of night, when they looked up at the sky, what did they see? Did they see what Abraham saw? Did they see families and nations? Did they imagine the sights, the smells, the taste, the touch, and the sounds of a multitude? Did they see Yahweh manifested in the multitude? Abraham could see himself in the kingdom. David could see himself in the kingdom. 
Paul could see himself in the kingdom. Do we see ourselves in the kingdom? So we're going to close our, our class with perhaps the most difficult aspect of our homework, and that's to visualize being in the kingdom, to take some time to earnestly reflect and try to engage all of our senses to think of what it would be, what activity could we perform in the kingdom? To be a teacher, do we put ourselves in the classroom? Do we see ourselves teaching? What is the subject and actually go through the lesson? When we visit the temple, do we visualize walking the corridors and meeting the people along the way? We honestly can't get it wrong. It's slightly out of context, but Paul said at this present time, it's not worthy to be compared to the glory that is set before us. The kingdom is so much more than we can imagine, and yet it's worthwhile to see ourselves there, to go through and use our imagination and skills. The Israelites wandered in the wilderness because they could not appreciate the wonderful offer of a land of milk and honey. Let it not happen to us. Let's use the faculties of our imagination, the visualization to make the kingdom of God real for us and a motivation to serve Yahweh until he sends his son back to this troubled earth. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to lead this slide up. I think we've gone through a lot of hopefully practical techniques and exercises and things to stimulate our thinking, our conscience, and, and hopefully to motivate us to take the time that's provided to us while the Lord remains away, to compel us to make a difference in our lives and to add good habits and to strengthen our conscience and to be more appreciative and to have a heart that perceives and to truly visualize us in the kingdom doing the things that we can imagine to do. It may not turn out that way, but we, can't be, we certainly can't be wrong in going through that exercise.